attention. So we're here uh, to uh, help the uh, Cornwall Library celebrate its 150th uh, anniversary. And uh, I'm here to uh, introduce our, uh, our guest, our, our guest speaker. Uh, the guest speaker and uh, the Cornwall Library have a, a lot of similarities. <laughs> Beginnings. And so did our uh, so did our guests. So does our guest have humble beginnings. The Cornwall Library is uh, is known for uh, reading, learning, education, and community. And, and I would say that our guest has been uh, recognized for education, uh, learning, community, reading. She's been uh, recognized at the local level, her local level. She's been recognized at the state level. She's been recognized at the national level. She was uh, recognized by uh, President Obama. Yes. The Cornwall Library is, is now celebrating its 150th anniversary, and soon, our guest will be celebrating 150 days. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce Connecticut's fifth congressional district representative, Congresswoman Johanna Hayes. in this town since the first time we met and because just like this library so first of all congratulations as you celebrate your 150th anniversary for the library it really is amazing and you know so you and Gordon were the first people I met from Cornwall and someone said to me today well you know Gordon Ridgeway's not going to be there I said I have lots of friends in Cornwall it's not just Gordon but I I think probably, and, and, it, and it's, I think it's, it's quite appropriate that I first met you all in this room, in this library full of people, because I have learned so much from this community. So much about humility, so much about community, so much about respect for other people. I mean, sometimes you come with your own lens and your own perspective, and you really think that you have the monopoly on that, or it's exclusive to you. And what I learned from Cornwall is how similar we are. You know, I believed it and I thought I knew it, but I never truly experienced it until I came here. And that's why I kept coming back for square dancing and to hold Coco Chanel, the famous chicken, to visit farms, to knock on a door and get some lamb stew because there just really is a sense of community. And what I took away from that is I know it can be done because I've seen it done before. So when I go to Washington and people tell me about how communities are isolated and people are holding on to individuals, I say I know it can be done because I've seen it done before. And <laughs> I, this is probably not a good story, but my staff teases me all the time because they say if Cornwall was a drinking game, you'd be drunk all the time. <laughs> because everywhere I go, whether I'm giving a speech on the House floor, or whether I'm in committee, I always elevate the names and the stories of the people in this community. Because I want to remind people that Connecticut's fifth is not just Waterbury, Merritt, and Danbury in Britain. There are so many communities and so many people who share similar interests 
and just want safe and sound communities and a better world for their children, who want to retire in peace, who want schools that have high quality education. And I, I thank you. I thank you. Um, it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's kind of a running joke again amongst the Connecticut delegation because they say to me, how'd you win Warren and Cornwall? <laughs> it's because I spend my time and people want to be heard and I thank you. I thank you for sending me to Congress. Just to kind of give you a, this has been, I'm not even at 150 days yet, which seems crazy to me. but. It has been, it, it's hard work, but I'm so glad I'm there because I don't know if it was the size of this class or the temperature of the country, but literally we hit the ground and started running and there was so much work to be done. You know, my committees are education and labor, which it seems like a no brainer. And the second committee I asked for was agriculture. And the reason, <laughs> that's my second full committee and the reason I asked for agriculture is because I spent so much time in this northwest corner and there was something that, that did not feel good to me. People refer to themselves as the forgotten corner. And I said, how is it that people have kind of resigned themselves to the fact that we're almost too small to make an imprint or to, to have a voice in this conversation? And when I looked at all of the members on the agricultural committee, most of them are Midwestern farmers, large commercial farmers. You know, they're talking about tariffs and, and really industrial type large. And I says, well, what about the small family farmers or those rural communities? What about making sure that they have the education and the resources and the things that they need? And I went to the speaker and I said, it really is important for me to be on the Committee on Agriculture. And for that, I can thank you all for really advocating and sharing the stories of this community and how important they are. Just really quickly, some of the things that we've done. So um, I survived a shutdown. So listen, I'm getting stripes on my sleeve. We had the longest shutdown in, in the history of this country. Um, we have, uh, I've sat committee chair several times because again, there's so many of us, they had to put us somewhere. But some key pieces of legislation, some of the very things that you heard me talk about when I was here that very first time. and. It's interesting because not all of them were popular, but I never backed away. I was very consistent. This is what I believe in and it's worth fighting for. And I'm unapologetic in the pursuit of those things. Um, gun reform was a big thing for me. Keeping guns out of classrooms. I, inter I introduced my first piece of legislation. <laughs> House, we voted two bills off the floor um, to close the background check loophole and to close the Charleston loophole uh, that we voted out of Congress. And people say, well, what if the Senate doesn't accept it? I can't concern myself with what the Senate does. I'm there right now, and I have to do what I went there to do. We voted on an infrastructure bill for schools, a $100 billion school infrastructure bill, which includes, as a result of all of these new voices and new faces, um, broadband connectivity for rural schools and making sure that, you know, when I traveled around the country, there were kids who, in rural South Carolina, after football practice, got on a bus and drove to the McDonald's parking lot to do homework so that they could hook up to the broadband. In 2019, in the United States of America, that should not be happening. But, I think even more importantly, I see it happening in my own state where people just don't have the access. So without access to broadband, they're limited in their health care choices and access to different resources. Um, I was able to, I'm trying to think of so much, 150 days, so, so much. Uh, some other big things. On Friday, just on Friday, we voted for HR 5, which is the Equality Act, which um, made discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation illegal. Included it in the civil rights legislation in this country. We've, I signed on to write, as soon as I went into Congress, to the Brand New Deal. And it wasn't popular with a lot of people. And I was actually advised against it. What does this mean? And how are we going to pay for it? And what are people going to say? And why don't you just wait? And I said, but nothing else matters if people can't breathe. So the fact that we're doing nothing and not even talking about it is no longer an option. 
So we need to sit down, we need to pull it apart, we need to look at the layers and really try to figure out how do we be begin to address the needs that are, we're facing in this country when it comes to, in this world, when it comes to dealing with environmental challenges. And for as much as people say it was crazy, I tell you leadership took notice because just last week we voted on a climate action now, which was emergency funding for areas that were um, impacted by storms, tornadoes, hurricanes. So uh, Congress is, is beginning to understand that we have to have legislation that really begins to address some of our environmental concerns. Maybe it's not the Green New Deal, but to do nothing is no longer an option. Um, what else have we done? We said <laughs> HR1, transparency in government, was a huge one we, uh, to protect people's right to vote. If we haven't seen anything in this cycle, you, any legislation you're talking about means nothing if you don't have free and fair elections. And I, I think we, we saw, I, I, I understand how this works. I was a history teacher, I am a respecter of the Constitution. We have elections, we have one winner, that becomes my president. But when we have, when, when the fundamental system by which we operate is threatened, we have to answer to that. We have to make sure that that is protected because otherwise nothing else matters. So we really have been working hard to protect elections. Um, one, five, six, nine, eight. Um, my committee has been very exciting. Um, for the second time in her in her tenure, the Secretary of Education came before Congress. Uh, yeah, about that. <laughs> well, it was. I, I say to people, this is my real life. Like I am so passionate about this, and. I told someone earlier, when I was first running, I remember a woman saying to me very early in the campaign, I want to like you. <laughs> Which never was a good way to start a day. I want to like you. But you seem to be a single issue candidate. And she said, it seems like all you care about is education and children. And I looked at her and I said, well, you're not wrong. But the reason for that is, or the way I rationalize it in my mind is, I've given up on myself so many times. I've checked out, I've stopped caring, I've decided I couldn't do something, but I've never given up on my children. I've never stopped fighting for my children, working for my children. So when I see a world where we have failed children environmentally, politically, morally, socially, educationally, academically, then I feel like those things are worth fighting for. Most of the people who I talk to um, feel the same way, where they just want to, they always, they were working hard and fighting hard and investing in their community so that their children could have a better life. And I said, well, we would be so fortunate if we had elected officials who viewed the world as their <laughs> children, who thought about things through the eyes of the children that they're trying to protect. We would be so fortunate. So that was an uphill battle for me to try to help people understand that, yes, I care deeply about education, but with that comes everything else because before a kid could get to me and I could teach them, by the time they're sitting in front of me, all of those other systems had to have worked. The healthcare system, the housing system, you know, their communities. They had to have all the resources they needed. I couldn't teach a kid who had a toothache for seven months. I couldn't teach a kid who was hungry. I couldn't teach a kid who was homeless. So while you're just thinking about reading and writing skills and what happened when they were sitting in front of me, all of that baggage came with them. So when you talk about education as a, as a single issue, that's for a simple-minded person because I know enough to know that all of those issues are coupled in education and we can solve all these problems through education, whether it's educating people on their voting rights, educating people on their health care choices. We just, actually I just got an amendment passed on Friday because they, there was funding for all of the states to have to sign up people for the Affordable Care Act or for health care to reopen the marketplace. And they were, we were voting on a bill on money to help the states pay for that. And I said, well, what about my state? We have a statewide marketplace. There should be money set aside for states who have a statewide marketplace. And I'm like, why is no one else asking for this? But I realized that Connecticut has done a lot better than some of the other states on some of these issues. So they didn't need the money. 
But when I presented it, it was accepted, and that amendment passed. So when this funding comes out, Connecticut will have money set aside to help us with the marketplace as well. So it really, I, I never fully appreciated how much you could get done in Congress, because we see how little is getting done. <laughs> but elections have consequences. And the people who are at the table, the majority decides the agenda. The majority decides what goes to the floor. And being in this Democratic majority, we are able to bring the things to the floor, the things that I talked about you with. And I, you know, as an educator, I said it before I say it now, I never had the luxury of separating people out by Republican, Democrat, you know, by what party they were affiliated. I, I accepted people as they were. So this is a very different dynamic for me. Um, when I was the National Teacher of the Year, you walk in a room and everybody loves you. There's such adoration for teachers. As a politician, not so much. <laughs> As a politician with a D behind your name, it depends on what part of the state you're in. But I try to remind people that whether you voted for me or not, I am now your representative of Connecticut's 5th Congressional District. So I need to hear from you as well. I actually asked my staff because I met with the young Democrats have all these students who are always writing, they want to talk, and I said, I'd like to meet with the other Republicans as well. Because I'd like to hear from them what's important to them. I'd like to understand, because what I know is that there are people who are equally as passionate as I am about the things that they care about. And as their representative, I also have a responsibility to them. So I'm willing to, to listen, to hear, and I miss you guys. I'll be back for square dancing. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I, I, know, I always know that I'm, there's going to be a party if, if I don't go. Everybody turns out, everybody comes up. So it's just so good. To, thank you. Just from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I remember walking into this room that first time and my knees were shaking and I didn't know what to say. And I just laid it all on the table. And you guys listened and, and you were thoughtful and you were purposeful and you did your homework, and, and you, you made your vote count. And, and I appreciate that, because there are so many people that don't take a second look, that follow what is traditional, what is accepted, what everybody else is doing. And without ever stepping back and thinking, and I think we're at, we are at an inflection point in our history where we can't do what we've always done. We, and not that it's all bad, but if we're looking for different results, we can't do exactly what we've always done. And the things we care about, the things we care deeply about, we can't assume someone else is fighting for them. Because now, I guess, and this is what I'll close with, the thing that I am most surprised about in Congress, now that I'm in the room, is all of the things that I assumed somebody else was doing. You know, there were so many times where, just yesterday, what's today? Saturday. Friday, we had a caucus meeting, which one of my students said, what is that? How do you spend it? It's like a staff meeting. And 200 Democrats, and we're all talking, and we gaveled in, and we gaveled out, and afterwards I said, how do we open and close a meeting and not one mention of what just happened in Alabama? You know, so we're always assuming someone else is doing it. You have to make sure we have people in the room who are going to elevate these issues. who are going to talk in real time about the things that you're talking about at home. I was like, well, how, do, how, do we, as, how are we coming into this meeting and not even having a real conversation about what is happening right now? And, um, oh, I know I said I'm going to close three times, but I'm really going to close this time. <laughs> because I can't leave without saying this, because this is, this is the, what always have, has people on their seats, on the edge of their seats when I'm in a room. And it is impeachment. So, um, I said through the whole campaign, and I continue to say, I said, I wanted to see the Mueller report. Let's wait for the report. And then the report came out, and it, there were more questions than there were answers. I was like, what are we supposed to do with this? And now there's a lot of conversation about what are the next steps and what happens. And I, I know the responsibility that comes with this role. You know, Congress appropriates funds, but they also have the responsibility of oversight and war powers. And right now, we are in tumultuous times. You know, we had a briefing, and our relationships around this world are in peril. We are in a very dangerous place. And, you know, it's a dereliction of duty. I, I kept looking back over these documents. I read the report over and over. You know, we had a bunch of meetings on it. And there was something in it that stood out for me. And it said the findings were more significant than Watergate. So I, I can't, I, at that point, I said, how do we do nothing? 
if we're saying the findings are more significant than warning. So the oversight, the judiciary, the financial services community, I mean committee, you see they're continuing to hold hearings because right now it's evidentiary and gathering of the information. But I will tell you that that is not the only thing we're doing in Congress. You know, it's one of those things where people are fulfilling <laughs> oversight responsibility, but the work that affects your everyday lives is still being done. But I think more importantly than even investigating this president, I think that we have to ensure that we don't fundamentally alter the office of the president. It doesn't matter who it is. I promise you, if the same thing that was in this report was written about Barack Obama, my answer and my response would be the same thing. It doesn't matter who's in the office because the office doesn't belong to a person. It is the office of the president. And if we begin to let that be redefined and reshaped and altered, I fear we don't get that. So I, I want you to know that it's not like every 400 members of Congress every day are only investigating the president because that's not what's happening. We're having hearings and we're appropriating funds. We're going to have a budget done in June when we go back and vote on it. The earliest that it's been done, you know, where funds have been appropriated. We went right back and saved Special Olympics. We went right back and put TRIO and Gear Up and First Generation College programs back on the table. We're right now working for $350 million for um, addiction education and resources for communities, especially rural communities, because those are the ones that are hardest hit. So we're still working. So I know that that may not be what you see every day because it's a much better story to stand outside uh, a judiciary committee, but all the other committees are working. So I, I want you to rest assured, I don't know what it means, but I pray for this country every day because no matter what the outcome is, it's not good. It's not good. You know, that's not, that is not how we want to be perceived around the world. You know, that is not how we want our democracy redefined and reshaped. So I, I don't want you to think that's, that's all we're doing, but to not do it is not okay either. So I'm just excited to be back here. Thank you. I, I definitely will be back. I'm looking forward to the weather warming up. I'm going back and forth. You know, I actually, I, I took the circuitous route to get to Cornwall because I flew from D.C. last night. So um, I, I just miss you, and it's great seeing you. And I'm so humbled and grateful to be your representative. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, can we ask Lisa to come up and uh, give us a quick uh, history of the library? Thank you. I'm Lisa Smart, and here is my brief and wonderful little story about the Cornwall Library. First of all, Congresswoman Hayes, we're just so pleased you're here. It's really a gift. I hope you don't mind. I invited the governor to come to Cornwall. He was like, we should do something together. I was like, yeah, in Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> they all teased me. He's been to I've asked him to come with me to do something and to bring the state uh, secretary of agriculture up here to have some type of a meeting. So I'd love to do it here. Great. Here. Good. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, let's just start with the story. To a child, a library is a place of magic. Think about that. Remember when you were little, everything is here. All the stories in the world, the pictures to go with them. I was the little girl who buried herself in reading as a child. <clears throat> Much of my library time here was spent in Cornwall, in that building next door sitting on the floor of that old porch on the side of the building where the children's books were, reading books over and over again. I explored Scotland with Arthur Ransom and his family of children in Swallows and Amazons. And we didn't mean to go to sea, which is one of the best titles I think anybody ever had. But Janet Walker and I traded these Ransom books back and forth, read them over and over again, and we made a promise to ourselves that when we were old enough, whatever that meant, we would go to Scotland with our bicycles and look for Mr. Ransom. <laughs> what we would say to him was never quite clear to us, but we knew we had to find him. 
it was obvious even to a little kid back then in 1950 that the library next door was bursting with books, stuffed birds in a glass case, and everything else that makes a library a library. Sometime after that, the fiction se section moved across the hallway and began to line the walls of the town hall. The library was full and it needed a new home. But it wasn't until 1997 that the board of the Cornwall Library set about looking for a new home in earnest. The first mention in board minutes of the library of a need for more space was in the 1950s. It was a lifetime ago. So clearly the time had come. There are people here who remember the wrangles about how to create a new library, but in the end, the land here on Pine Street became available, and we found our new home in the heart of this community. I was chair of the board in those days, and the obligation to raise one and a half million dollars to construct this building was worrying, to say the least. But there were so many who helped. Ginny Potter, then the librarian, led the effort to determine how we would fill this new place with books and videos and computers. <laughs> Jim Terrell headed the building committee, and everyone on the board leaned in to help. Our architect, Ken McLean, had a summer home across the street, a circumstance which we felt worked in our favor. <laughs> he would never build something that he didn't want to look at over his breakfast cereal every morning. The push to raise the funds was ably administered by Amy Cady, who then became the first librarian in this building. We talked, <coughs> we talked to everyone who would listen. We engaged the town in the promise that this was going to be the kind of library where we would all want to spend our time, a place to bring our children and grandchildren, a place for us to keep on learning and staying in touch with the world. All of us must have been persuasive because in spite of the warnings that we would never pull it off, we raised $1.9 million. The state contributed the maximum that it could. It was the first large-scale fundraising campaign in recent town history. We had enough left over in the end to start a healthy endowment. They say a generation is about 30 years. If that is so, then five generations of us have contributed time and devotion to this library. The books have moved from 19th century parlors to the stone building next door, and finally to this beautiful place. Each generation made its gift to the generation that followed so that the Cornwall Library has a secure future based on a solid, generous past. There are challenges to be sure, but we can all be proud of this place. It's the core of our existence as a community. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. That was great. Uh, and thank you, Congresswoman. This has really been a terrific way to celebrate the 150th anniversary. You know, if you think back to what the founders of the library were probably thinking when they were sitting in the Reverend Sanford's uh, study 150 years ago, you know, wondering how they were going to pay for the first dozen books or so, um, you have to think <coughs> that uh, the celebration we're having today is so far beyond anything they could have imagined uh, at that time. And I think it speaks really to the success and the efforts and the strength of all the people who've worked for the library over that 150 years. Uh, I'm chairman of the uh, Board of Trustees now. Um, there have been many before us, there have been many trustees before us, there have been many librarians, many volunteers, many friends. Um, and they've all made it a change. I think as a library we're probably facing more challenges now, uh, given what's happening to libraries and uh, books generally and reading. Uh, but I do think that the Cornwall Library really is reacting and succeeding and prospering uh, in this environment in a way which we can all be proud of. Uh, and I think the thing I like hearing most about the library uh, is the fact that people view the library as the social center of town. Um, we provide books, we provide programs, we provide lectures, we provide art shows, uh, and I think that all goes a long way to making the library as successful as it has been. 
So, although none of us, I'm afraid, not even the young ones are going to be here, let's look forward to the next 150 years. <laughs> <laughs> So low cups. <laughs> so there's a theme over here. Our theme this year is sustainability. And uh, if you've passed the school, you've seen our little logo in the fence. And that's been taken down, and we're putting up a new one. So if you donate your cups today, you can look for the message in the next couple of weeks and see what we've come with. <laughs> Thank you.